Uh, okay, so today um, we want to talk to you uh, about some experiments that uh, Greg Ellis and I have been doing in the lab. Uh, in general, the previous talk I think was perfect. This is not going to be, by the way, specifically about worship space acoustics, but I think what you'll see is that many of the topics that I'm going to be interested in and talking about really are, are highly relevant uh, in an acoustic worship space. So, for example, uh, in a situation where we have the acoustics, say, of a worship space, those acoustics really need to be able to support some basic auditory functions, things such as understanding speech effectively, uh, uh, the perception of music. Of course, that's a critical piece in worship spaces. Uh, and then a, another piece that you might not necessarily think about, but uh, that is spatial hearing. Uh, we, we need to be able to attend to certain things in those spaces and know where they're coming from. Uh, so the talk today that I'm going to give to you, uh, and I should apologize in advance, I'm, I, I'm going to be talking about things that I'm really not particularly well trained in, really only one of those bubbles up there I have training in, uh, but I'm going to be talking about a few of them nevertheless. And, and what I'm going to focus on is the relationship between room acoustics, spatial hearing, and speech perception. We're going to leave music out, but I think there actually are some applications uh, related to music, uh, and we can talk about those at the end. Okay, so here's the basic framework that we've been working on uh, to try and relate some of these things. We've been interested specifically in, in reverberation related to room acoustics. And as, as probably everyone in this room knows, uh, th there's a, a well-known relationship between the amount of reverberation and the level of speech understanding that results. And uh, essentially, at some point, as reverberation is increased, speech understanding is going to take a hit. Okay, so I think we're just going to uh, take that as a given. Also, I think another thing that we can take at least as somewhat of a given is the fact that there is some perceptual aspect to reverberation. If that were not true, uh, we would not have architectural acousticians studying aspects of reverberation. So there clearly is some sort of perceptual uh, or set of perceptual aspects related to this. So the question that we're interested in is, is there some sort of relationship between the perceptual aspects of reverberation? Perceived reverberation, does that affect speech understanding? So that's our, our working hypothesis, that there may be a relationship there. So what I'm going to do today is tell you about two experiments, one related to the perceived reverberation part, one related to speech understanding part. And uh, in some maybe departure from the previous talks, we're going to look at actually some very unrealistic situations, situations that could never happen in, in a real situation, but yet we think are actually useful in the laboratory to try and determine what might be going on uh, with some of these different relationships. So uh, let me just walk through the methods here a little bit. We're going to use uh, all virtual sound techniques in which we rely on uh, binaural room impulse responses. Uh, and in this case, we're going to rely on models of those uh, that are constructed based on, on some modeling techniques that we've been using for a while now. They're quite simple. Uh, they rely on an image model to do uh, spatial processing of the early reflections. We rely on uh, measurements of the acoustics of the head and ears, the head-related transfer function to do proper spatial uh, positioning of the direct path source and some of the early reflections. And then we use some statistical modeling techniques to model the late reverberation. So in the situation I'm going to tell you about, so here are just a couple of cartoons about what it might look like for a particular listening situation. In this case, sound off to the side, three meters away. Uh, and we just see a cartoon of what the, the impulse response plotted in terms of, of energy as a function of time might look like. There is some amount of energy that reaches the ear directly, direct path energy, and then, of course, arriving later in time is reverberant sound energy. Both ears get that. Since the sound is off to the side, uh, the same side ear, in this case the right ear, will of course receive higher level um, than the other side ear. So that's why the direct path is higher there. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to simply ask listeners, we're gonna, what we're going to do is adjust the level of the reverberation and ask listeners to give us ratings of how reverberant they think the sound is. Okay, and we're going to do that now in a few different cases, actually two different cases. In one case, we're going to do it where we just manipulate the level in both ears equally. Okay, we're going to call that our natural room simulation. 
And then in another situation, which we're going to call our hybrid room sim uh, simulation, we're going to manipulate level only in a single ear, in the same side ear, ipsilateral ear. How are we going to ask listeners about perceived reverberation? We're going to use a very uh, simple technique that's been used uh, a lot in the loudness literature to estimate loudnesses of sounds, uh, so-called magnitude estimation. And basically the way this works is that uh, on a given trial in the experiment, we're always going to play two sounds. The first one is going to be the standard. Okay, and in this case, that's going to be the, the natural simulation of the room uh, using a speech stimulus in this case. And we're going to tell the listeners that that has a, a level of the reverberation of 100. That's your standard. And then we'll play a comparison signal in which we uh, manipulate either the level uh, of reverb in both ears equally or only in one ear. And then we'll ask the listeners to make a rating uh, based on that. So if they think the sound is uh, half as reverberant, say, then they should give a number that's half as big, like 50. Okay. Uh, right. And that's, as I said, uh, same type of methods used in loudness. Okay, uh, so let me uh, now start showing you some results here. We actually did this for those different types of stimuli uh, all mixed together. So the listeners just listened to some that were real, some that were hybrids, et cetera, uh, and made their ratings. But in terms of uh, displaying the data, I'm going to uh, break this out separately, show you the natural rooms first, then show you the results from the hybrid rooms. So here, starting um, uh, with the most reverberant stimulus, which was also our standard, we can see that uh, the average of 10 listeners' responses was approximately 100, which is what they were instructed to do. That's a nice check. And then as we uh, decrease the level of the reverb, okay, uh, their ratings should go down. And lo and behold, they do. Okay, down to uh, this case down here, uh, where we have uh, just completely uh, attenuated out all uh, reverberation, we're left with an anechoic signal there, only direct path. Okay, and then if we do things like fit a function to those data, and in, in this case it's a linear function on logarithmic coordinates, which is equivalent to a power function in linear coordinates, uh, and estimate some parameters of that function, uh, and in this case the parameter of interest is the exponent, uh, we see that that exponent is about 0.3, roughly 0.3, and that's actually significant because uh, that is very similar to the exponent that you would get if you ask the listeners to judge loudness in a loudness type experiment. So this tells us, okay, when we manipulate level in this way, that what listeners are probably doing is giving us some sort of estimate of the loudness of the reverberant sound. That makes perfect sense. Now, question becomes, what do they do in that other type of stimulus, this hybrid stimulus, where we only manipulate the level in one ear? Those are the data from that experiment, and you see that th th that portion of the experiment. Uh, results are quite different now. When we manipulate only level to one ear, and this is the part, of course, that could never happen in a real situation, now we see that perceived reverberation is essentially constant. It does not change with the level of reverb in the ipsilateral ear, same side ear. And we could do the same thing, fit a function there, and of course it's flat. It has an exponent of nearly zero. Okay, so the, taking those two results together this is kind of an interesting result. Uh, that, to us, seems to say pretty clearly that the ipsilateral ear, when you have a sound off to the side, is not contributing to the perception of reverb in that case, because it's constant. So now the question becomes, well, what is con uh, contributing to the perception of reverb? Of course, could be the sound in the contralateral ear, because in the hybrid case, that is constant. Or it might perhaps be something related to the binaural system. And just, just double check that quickly. Uh, we went through and computed the interaural cross correlation coefficient in octave bands for our two types of signals. And I plot these here now as a function of the reverberation gain in our manipulation. And you can see that for the room stimulus, uh, we do get quite a bit of change in the IACC, and it's, and it's in a way that you might expect. So in the natural room, signals are less correlated at the two ears, then when I start attenuating reverberation and become more an anechoic, they become more correlated. That makes perfect sense. Uh, over here in the hybrid stimulus, though, you see that IACC changes much less, uh, and in fact very little, uh, as a function of changing reverb only in the ipsy ear. Why is that? That's probably because the sound in the ipsilateral ear is in fact dominated by the direct path, 
and then we correlate with the same thing in the other ear. So once you think about that, that actually makes sense too. So at this point, so yeah, ICC is essentially constant. At this point, we can't differentiate between those two results. Could be that we're getting constant results because the sound in the contralateral ear is the same. Could be because the binaural statistics are also similar. So clearly we need to be and are planning to do some follow-up experiments here to try and answer some of those questions. Okay, so that's experiment one. Now I want to tell you about the second part of this, the speech understanding part. And basically what we did here uh, is set up an experimental situation where we took a subset of the stimuli from that first experiment. So basically we want to look at the extreme cases here. So we can look at our natural room. Uh, we can look at the extreme case of the hybrid room where there is no reverberant energy going to the same side ear. Uh, and we can look at our anechoic room where there simply is no reverberant energy. Okay. And what we're going to do is now try and predict and measure speech intelligibility in those three cases. Uh, and, and for those of you that, that are interested, we use a, a, a particular type of task for doing this called the coordinate response measure. Uh, people are generally very good at understanding speech using that task because it's a closed set of materials, so we have to run. Uh, we, always, we run with a competing noise source that's, in this case, it's co-located with the, the target. Uh, and we have to run at a, a, a pretty extreme signal-to-noise ratio, so a fairly low, quite low signal level relative to the noise uh, in order to uh, not, not be at ceiling in performance. Okay, the prediction part first. Uh, we're going to use some uh, standard methods to use uh, to predict speech intelligibility in rooms, the speech transmission index. Uh, in this case, of course, we have binaural signals, so we're going to look at the two ears uh, separately. And in general, the way this, this index works is it uh, takes advantage of the fact that uh, speech is a signal in which there is uh, an amplitude modulation characteristic and that our understanding is uh, governed in large part by interpretation of that characteristic. Uh, so it takes that and the fact, of course, that room acoustics affect uh, this amplitude modulation uh, characteristic, and they do so in a pretty complicated way, and that's what these uh, uh, contour plots are meant to represent here. Uh, these are, uh, the contours are uh, measures of the modulation transfer functions uh, as a function of audio frequency on the vertical axis. So the uh, hotter colors indicate less modulation loss. Um, anyway, and so the speech transmission index then works by looking at a subset of that space uh, that I'm indicating by these, uh, this grid pattern here that's a, a, a selection of audio frequencies and modulation frequencies and then analyzes the uh, extent of modulation in those uh, regions, and then essentially comes up with a single number um, uh, related to that uh, that indicates is a predictor of intelligibility, where uh, larger numbers on the index indicate a better predicted intelligibility. So we do that for the two ears separately. In this case, this is our natural room, and we uh, account for the fact that we're uh, listening in noise, and we come up with a couple of different STI numbers. And uh, for now, let's just look at, at you know, uh, assume that the auditory system looks at the better ear, which in this case is the near ear. And of course, it uh, gives you a better predicted intelligibility. Okay, let's go one step further now and also implement a, a binaural piece to this uh, intelligibility prediction. So basically using the top parts that I just showed you, plus uh, some information having to do with the correlation of the, two, the signals at the two ears. Uh, this thing is called an interaural uh, cross correlogram. Uh, where hot colors indicate more correlated signals as a function of auditory audio frequency. Uh, and then the basic idea here is that if we want to come up with some sort of optimal combination of the signals in the two ears, what we do is we look, uh, we determine regions that produce maximum correlation between the signals at the two ears, uh, note that delay, and then adjust the signal in one of the ears to that delay such that when the sounds sum, they're summing in, a, uh, in an optimal sense. Uh, related to the interaural correlation. And then uh, do the same thing and go ahead and compute uh, uh, modulation transfer space like this and then STI. Okay, so that would be based on essentially a, a binaural look uh, at the signals uh, used to understand speech. And then uh, a 
So this is just following some work that's been done on binaural STI. And basically what we do finally is come up with the one STI number that's the best out of all of these cases. So either better ear or binaural, we pick the best one. Okay. So here are some numbers uh, for the natural room case. Here are some numbers now. So I'm going to jump to our hybrid case. So a case where we have a clean signal now in the right ear, and we can see that the modulation characteristics are cleaned up a lot, which is, we would predict because there's now no reverb there. And of course, when we do that, we now have a much better ear signal, and STI jumps uh, substantially okay, in both cases. Uh, and then just compare that to now anechoic. We're going to clean up the other side. Um, and STI, of course, now jumps, uh, well, actually does not jump any more uh, than we were before because we haven't done anything now better to the better ear. The better ear was already at ceiling. Okay, so now what we can do is we can take these STI numbers and uh, do some conversion to make predictions about what we expect to see in terms of intelligibility with that task. Uh, and that's what we have here. Uh, so basically, the, the predictions say that we should see lower intelligibility in the room and then higher intelligibility in both the hybrid and the anechoic, and that those should be equally intelligible because they both have the same better ear. And some psychophysical data from five listeners uh, shows that we pretty much uh, capture that trend in the data, uh, pretty, pretty much. Okay, so what does this say? Let's go back and now try and combine this a little bit with experiment one. Um, so basically what we just showed now is that this hybrid signal from experiment two, uh, hybrid room signal results in speech intelligibility that's equal to anechoic space, okay? But it also results in a perceived reverberation characteristic that is equal to the natural room. So this is a very interesting, what we're terming dissociation now between uh, perceived intelligibility, perceived reverberation and intelligibility. Okay, so it seems like on the one hand the ipsilateral ear dominates uh, speech understanding and reverb. That's probably not so surprising. Uh, but the surprising part is that in this situation, uh, the ipsilateral ear doesn't appear to be doing anything to our perception of reverberation. Okay, so back to our original framework, I think this says pretty clearly that this relationship between perceived reverb and speech understanding is just not always there. And this is a case where that does not exist. So I think we have falsified that working hypothesis by showing this, even though, of course, this is a, a somewhat unrealistic situation. Now, the thing, part that we think is sort of more interesting, and just to wrap things up here, I think that this could potentially be used uh, to our advantage in, in a variety of situations. We, I think many of us in this room can imagine situations where uh, we might like to have both a clear signal and one that has a high or some amount of perceived reverberation because there are sound quality benefits to signals that are perceived as being reverberant. And we all know about them. Reverberant uh, voice sounds better than dry voice. Uh, the architectural acousticians know, of course, that reverberant spaces sound better than highly dry spaces. So this might be a situation where we could we could essentially have our cake and eat it too, uh, have uh, signals that are both reverberant and uh, intelligible. And this, of course, may be especially uh, interesting and relevant for folks with hearing impairment because folks with hearing impairment often experience extreme uh, functional levels of impairment in terms of understanding speech and reverberation. So perhaps this could be a way that we can clean up uh, the signals for understanding speech, but uh, still retain some of the sound quality benefits of having uh, reverberant sound in terms of listening to music and enjoying the quality aspects of speech. Thank you very much. <laughs>